start the meeting by giving you the first presentation. Is the microphone working? Right, we'll start again. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and start the meeting with this talk. What I'm going to give you is very basic uh, pathophysiology facts. Things, I start from things we learn at medical school, and it goes like this, that um, varicose veins, varicose veins, result from abnormal desensibility of the connective tissues of the vein wall, we all know that. The primary varicose veins occur in the absence of previous DVT, while by definition, secondary varicose veins are the consequence of DVT. And then, recanalization may give rise to relative obstruction incompetence of the deep, the superficial, and the perforated veins. In 30% of patients, with deep venous reflux, the etiology is primary valvular incompetence. In people who get DVT, spontaneous lysis or recanalization occurs in a variable number, which varies from 50 to 70% following DVT. And we have learned that rapid thrombus resolution after DVT is associated with higher incidence of valve competence. All very basic facts we've learned 20 years ago. Now, the post body syndrome is the result of venous hypertension, which arises from valve incompetence and or outflow obstruction. And venous hypertension produces skin capillary damage and all the changes in the skin that we are familiar with. Now, the prevalence of the post body syndrome is variable, and it depends on the extent, location of the thrombosis and the treatment we have given to the patient and as you learn later on today and tomorrow, other factors such as whether the lymphatic system is able to cope with the extra capillary leakage. The risk of the post thrombotic syndrome is higher in patients with recurrent thrombosis and the presence of thrombophilia. And the people who really get into trouble are the people who get inadequate treatment with the warfarin, only one or two months, and then they get another DVT, and the DVT second time blocks the collaterals and they get into trouble. We also know that patients who have both chronic obstruction and reflux have the highest incidence of skin changes and alteration. We have also learned in recent years that the risk is lower in patients who have three things, adequate anticoagulation therapy, especially with long molecular weight heparin, and we now have five randomized control trials that people went on low molecular heparin for six months compared with six months of warfarin. And in nine out of 10 cases, you get a canalization. Why well, this doesn't happen with warfarin? Early mobilization and adequate and continuous compression for two years. We have four randomized control trials now. So this is in the guidelines. In COVID and perforated veins, we have a lot of debates. Uh, and they occur in the presence of superficial and deep venous reflux because if you have blood leaking out of a perforator, it has to go somewhere. Uh, the number, diameter, volume, and blood velocity through the perforators it increases with increasing clinical severity. And finally, superficial and perforated vein incompetence with normal deep veins is found in 40% of patients with skin changes and ulceration. Many years ago, we used to believe that skin ulcers are deep venous disease. This is not the case. And this is good because we can cure these patients easily. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Now, the most important thing we've learned in the last few years is the role of the white cells. And you have environmental and local factors, usually hypoxia, that make the white cells adhere to the endothelium and that produces remodeling of the venous wall and damage to the valves, reflux and hypertension, as you'll see in a minute. What happens with these uh, triggering mechanisms, white cells uh, adhere to the endothelium, they go through, they release inflammatory mediators, proteases and free radicals and all these substances, and they produce <coughs> fra fragmentation of the elastic fibers, extracellular matrix accumulation, and you get venous wall remodeling 
in vertical waves. Now, but this is so important that I'm going to show you this movie, and I want you to go away remembering it. And this is what happens with the white cells. The adhesion molecules slow them down, so they are rolling on the endothelium. Then you get adhesion. What follows is degranulation. Then they go through, they migrate through the endothelium, and they produce inflammatory reaction. Now, you may say this, Nicolaides, this is a movie, it's a nice movie. How close is it to reality? Well, it's very close to reality. I mean, here is an electron microscope, and here is one white cell <coughs> about to adhere, and this is one just going through the endothelial cells. So this is, this is reality. And the same thing happens to the valves. You have the white cells damaging the valves. And this has been elegantly shown by uh, John Bergman. And now we finish the presentation by going to the microcirculation. When you have venous hypertension, the capillaries become markedly dilated and tortuous. They become like glomeruli. The flow in the skin is, enorm is increased enormously. It's increased five times. But the flow in the nutritional epidermal capillary loops is reduced. So it produces a low transcutaneous PO2. And then, because of this high venous hypertension, you get excess pericapillary fluid, fibrin, and all the other uh, proteins, and uh, this is what you get. So, if you really think about it, you get valve damage and reflux, varicose, uh, vein wall remodeling and varicose veins, capillary leakage, edema, capillary damage, skin changes, and venous ulceration, and with all this, venous hypertension is increasing. The same thing happens in the microcirculation, as I explained before. And this picture summarizes it all, that you get the white cell migration and adhesion, then you get fibrosis, you get extravasation of red cells, hemosiderin deposition, and you get the <coughs> lipodermatosclerosis and skin pigmentation, you get the capillary leakage, edema, inflammation, Tissue necrosis, sorry, this is sensitive. Okay. Tissue necrosis and eventually venous ulceration. Uh, the final slide tells you about sinusitis uh, of fibers. We now know that this nasty feeling of uncomfortable sensation in the legs comes by stimulation of the nociceptors by the inflammatory mediators. And these C fibers produce diffuse pain. The pain is not the pain. If you put something hot on the skin, you, you have a very sharp pain. But if you die, distend the esophagus with a balloon, you get a very diffuse, unpleasant pain with a high negative influence on quality of life. And this is the problem we have with chronic venous disease. Some years ago, we written a review article that summarizes all this in New England Journal of Medicine so I suggest you look it up if you want to go into the details. It's getting a little bit out of date, but the essential things are there. Thank you very much.